It is now my privilege to introduce our second keynote speaker of the evening. His scientific work deepened the understanding of the rejection of tumors or transplanted organs by the immune system. President and Chief Scientific Officer at Refuge Biotechnologies, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Francesco Marincola. Dr. Marincola was unable to make it, but uh, he sent me the recording of his presentation. I want, first of all, thank uh, Dr. Shashi and the organizers of the, this annual event for inviting me to give the final presentation on the topic of precision medicine. Thank you very much. Let me share the screen. You know, hope you can all see it. So the topic uh, reminds me of a quote from a Stanford professor who used to say uh, that there are three golden rules for the successful treatment of any disease. And in fact, during the lecture, we were all about to take notes when he also added, unfortunately, we don't know any of them. So it was, man, I guess is a funny quote, but at the same time, it was interesting and re relevant because at those times we were making so much progress in the basic sciences and that yet in the mid eighties, there was not really much uh, of a translation into something that was making a difference for the treatment of patients, particularly cancer patients. And so it's very important to try to figure out why these things uh, happen and it's always useful to go back to the big thinkers. And for example, an interesting uh, quote that uh, I helped me uh, was uh, about a quote from Voltaire, a French philosopher of the 1700s, who used to say that, that doctors are men who prescribe medicine of which they know little, to cure diseases of which they know less, in human beings of which they know, of whom do they, know, they know nothing. And actually, this is a, a real quote. And uh, those things, however, changed since then. And nowadays, things are moving in a different direction. So I want to qu quote a contemporary Chinese philosopher and very loyal companion of mine, Anna Wang, who instead believes that doctors and men prescribe medicine of which they know pharmacogenomics to cure diseases of which they know functional genomics, in human beings of, what they know, of whom they know the whole genome. So that's precision medicine. So jokes apart, what are we doing now in our, uh, in our um, company to work in trying to apply some precision medicine concept for the treatment of cancer using adoptive cell therapy. And uh, I want to emphasize that the key for all treatments is actually what we call the therapeutic index, which is a quantitative assessment of a drug safety proportional to its effectiveness. And particularly for cancer, there are good example: chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or even immunotherapy with the tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-2, interleukin-12 are very powerful, and most of them are limited by the fact they're very toxic, and in fact, they can kill the patient before they kill the cancer. So, precision medics now opens an opportunity to increase the breadth of the therapeutic index. A good example, for example, is the, uh, the use of uh, uh, pathway inhibitors, like a BRF inhibitor in melanoma, which targets with 10 to 100-fold more potency the uh, uh, BRAF gene when it's mutated and causing the melanoma than the wild type. So you have a hundredfold more power. And so in therapeutic index, theoretically, that is going to be very high, hundredfold higher, because the chance of targeting normal tissue is very low. Now, the same principle can be applied to adoptive cell therapy, whether CAR or T or T cells uh, with, a, um, with a, a natural T cell receptor. And, uh, and, and the target being the antigen. In that case, for example, if you uh, target a neoepitope, meaning a mutated protein that is present only in the cancer, then you have an in therapeutic index potentially infinite because there is no such thing in normal cells. The problem with that, of course, you have is very personalized. Every patient may have different 
about. So it's complex. It's now an off-the-shelf approach, but it's very, very valid one. The other, the opposite is targeting normal, uh, sorry, sh antigen or share between benign and neoplastic tissue. Then the cost of therapeutic index, re uh, a lot revolves over the intensity, the density of the antigen. And so, for example, for HER2, uh, is a classic uh, uh, antigen targeted for treatment of breast cancer and other HER2 positive tumors. The point is that this antigen is much more expressed in uh, neoplastic tissues than in benign tissue. And therefore, there is a, the differential is uh, based on these differences. But I want to point out that actually this is only one factor. There's much more in adoptive cell therapy to modify the therapeutic index in one direction or another, that's simply the relationship between, like in, in, in the Vemuraf, between the drug and the target. Because here is a very simple, straightforward dynamic between a chemical and a target. Here, there are live cells that make a lot of other, they have a lot of other factors, make them more or less active. And so we described this in a recent paper we published in the Journal of Therapy of Cancer with Anna Juan, Lisa Butterfield, and uh, Alessandra Chuzan, which, sorry, I missed here. So Amy is not in the use actually published. So this, we consider this on target differential. Difference between the targets, it's an important factor. But what is the off-target lateral blocks that, uh, that uh, intervene before the actual T cells can recognize the antigen? There are many more. One is persistence. We've been shown more and more if the T cells are not fit, they die very quickly. They don't even get to the tumor. And if they get there, they don't colonize the tumor. Trafficking, they might not get to the tumor. We'll give an example. Engagement with the tumor cells, and of course, they have to overcome a very strong immune suppression and uh, immune infiltrated tumors. That will be called the true therapeutic index for adoptive cell therapy. So persistence has been discussed a lot from many groups, but I guess I'll give only an example without much time. And that revolves on the concept of potency and ability of T cells to persist, which in turn, is related, of course, to the number of T cells that are given in different ranges for CAR Ts versus Ts to infiltrate lymphocytes and fitness, their immunogenicity, they don't allow them to survive, the, their stemness, ability to survive and don't become exhausted, and don't become terminally differentiated. And the best example is a paper published by uh, Chris McCall. Uh, Stanford, where they put a CGAN, is a major modulator of stemness of cells. Uh, and uh, if you put CGAN, uh, constitutively expressed in, uh, in uh, CAR T cells, and you have a higher expression that would normally is there, the result is an increase in survival in mice. So this is a regular CAR targeting a particular cancer that expresses the uh, target antigen, and this is the same CAR with CGAN you have a major survival advantage. The problem with this, CGAN is the first described oncogene. And so putting CGAN into, into lymphocytes is a very good chance, is a, an exogenous genes, a transgene, has a very high chances of turning uh, these T cells into lymphomas. So it, it is not as simple to apply this to humans, this concept. Uh, the second step uh, is tra trafficking. T cells have to get to the tumor. And there are many things that actually can impede that. So the T cells, first of all, could cause a generalized inf inf um, what we call cytokine release syndrome, uh, release of cytokines that make give a lot of general toxicity. Something we see, for example, with COVID as well. Um, that is a limiting factor in the number of T cells that can be given and what other uh, concomitant treatment can be that given. But then they can be dispersed before they get to the tumor, through pulmonary trapping, uh, sequestration in other lymphoid organs, and then leakage and externalization, particularly with, when uh, substances like interleukin-2 are given, they of course increase leakage all over the body. At the same time, they can also be suppressed by systemic immune suppression, 
and they also can be uh, amenable to the what we call cytokine sink. That a lot of the cycles and they're important for their survival. Homeo their homeostasis might be taken away by other uh, competing cells. A good example of that is a study which we did a long time ago, which has almost been forgotten, but I think is a key, where uh, tumor infiltrated lymphocytes obtained from the patient and then given back to the patient for to treat their melanoma were labeled with the uh, irradioactive label in the 111 and then traced to see if they went to the tumor. Well, in 20, 12 cases, the T cells did not even get to the tumor. And in those 12 cases, none of the patients responded, showing how critical is trafficking. If there is no trafficking, there's gonna to to be a response. Now, in other 26 cases, the, the T cells went to the tumor, you could trace them. And in only 10 of that cases, the, the, the patient responded, the tumor regressed, showing that there were two major categories of reason why uh, adoptive cell therapy doesn't work, of which one very important is simply the T cells just don't get there for the reasons we explained before. What else? The important part then is the next, which is engagement. Let's assume they get there. So why they don't respond? Why the other half of the patient didn't respond even the till went there? First of all, do they engage with the tumor? Do they get activated from the antigen? And also, and then can they overcome the immune suppression? And that's what most of my talk is going to be about. So if you think about when they get to the tumor, the important thing is, uh, sorry, to the peripheral circulation having uh, uh, passed the systemic uh, hurdles, they have the opportunity to hold either to the tumors to deliver on target efficacy or to the normal tissue, and that is on target toxicity. And of course, the ideal situation is this one, when you have inflamed tumors that are very chemoattractive, they, because inflammation, one of the factors or the character of an inflamed tissue is that attracts T cells, it attracts immune cells to overcome the inflammatory process in case of infections. And in tumors, it's similar. And so the T cells go there, we know because they're already there to start with. And so in that case, you have a major advantage of the therapeutic index because most of the cells will go there and they're not going to go to normal tissues, which normally are non inflamed. Normal tissue don't have T cells. If you look at T cells, normal tissue, very rarely uh, you will see any T cell. But of course, the opposite can happen. And you have a situation where you have a very cold tumor that is not chemoattractive. At the same time, you have tissue that is inflamed for other reasons. And so the T cells are going to go there. And if you have the same target antigen, maybe let's say HER2, you're going to have a lot of toxicity independent of the variance. So the therapeutic index based on density is relevant only after all of these other factors are taken into consideration, which we rarely do in adoptive cell therapy. They don't know of. So what do we mean by that? There are three kinds of tumor. Well, everybody would agree now. There are the very inflamed tumors, and that's happened across all tumors. They're very inflamed, so very chemoattractive. The black dots here are T cells, and as you can see, these are very infiltrated with that. Then there are the desert tumors. There is no infiltration, no chemoattraction, there is no inflammation, and that's pretty much what a normal tissue looks like. They don't attract T cells. And then there are another category that's been recognized, which represents about a third of the tumor, which are excluded tumors. There are T cells around the tumor nest, the brown spots here, and here is the cancer. They get there, so there is chemo attraction. They get there, but they cannot get in. There's a, some kind of chemo repulsion when they get to the tumor site. Now, an important point to keep in mind is that in this case, if you look at their activation of their genes, a very important phenomenon is observed that the same tissue here, this is a study we did with uh, uh, Sarah Pei at the Mass General in order for NGL cancers. If you take these tissues and you ask a pathology blindly to count how many CD8 T cells are there, irrespective of where they are, of where they're distributed, you see that you can measure how many there are. And there are cold tumors where there are not T cells. And there are the other two tumors where, in fact, there are T cells overall. And then you see how many of the genes associated with inflammation were rejection. We described that a long time ago as the immunological cause of rejection. A group of genes you need to have to see rejection. You see that 
there is a very strong correlation. The more T cells you have, CD8 T cells you have, the more inflammation in, in uh, immunologic cancer rejection genes. But the important thing, you cannot differentiate just looking at these parameters between this and this. This is important because shows that T cells that get here, they are seeing the antigen, they become activated, they make all, they produce all the genes associated with activation of T cells, like interferon gamma, like uh, perforin, granzyme, chemokine, everything that is typical of a T cell activated, but they cannot function. So what's the difference? Oh, but I want to point out, these are still opportunity for T and CAR Ts because the T cells go there. Here it's difficult because when you give the T cells, unlikely to go there. And so other, other things should be done to change the behavior of the tumor, to turn them inflamed, chemo traffic to bring the T cells. You need a combination with something beyond the adoptive cell transfer cells. So how do you approach that? We approach by using a, uh, a uh, invention that was uh, delivered by uh, Stanley Chi. Stanford was the inventor of DCAS9 or DECAS9 or nucleus deactivated Cas9 protein. So it's, you know Cas9 can localize specifically to individual genes in the genome, cut them and change them. This one is deactivated, can localize very specifically, but doesn't do anything to the genome, making very, very, very safe because then that doesn't cause any permanent structural alteration of the DNA, which would cause a lot of different genome toxicity. On the other hand, when it uh, arrives there, can modulate by targeting regularly the region of the genes that are regulating their expression, can regulate the expression of a gene. And if you, have, if you fuse a repressor to the, nucle the Cas9, you block the expression of the gene. If you, um, uh, if you add an activator, you increase the expression of the gene, referring to CRISPR interference in one and CRISPR activation for the other. So how do we approach that in our company and refuge? We uh, approach by, first of all, trying to find ways to overcome immunosuppression. And that happens, a very important point to keep in mind, very well recognized, we described that a few years ago, but now everybody would agree, the tumors that are immunogenic, these tumors, which are few of T cells, are also the tumors that where all the immunoregulatory, immunosuppressing mechanisms are. And this is, and that is not an hypothesis, it's been shown over and over as the study thousands of tumors. The, Reality is, the best explanation is that this is an evolutionary bottleneck. Inflamed tumor are very genetically unstable. That causes a lot of immunogenicity because they produce a lot of things that are not normal. But at the same time, to survive, the only way to survive, they need to have a lot of immune regulatory mechanism. Otherwise, they are eliminated during their evolution. In, this is what we refer to as compensatory immune resistance. And that's what we you overcome by increasing the amount of things uh, but, but interfering with a lot of the factors that decrease their ability of T cells to function. For example, you can multiplex the modulation of checkpoint inhibitors like PD-1, TIN-3, and so forth. Can you block many? Because that's why sometimes PD-1 doesn't work in immunogenic tumors, not because it's irrelevant, but because there are too many other mechanisms that block the T cells, and so that relieving one is sufficient. At the same time, what do you do for where immunoexcluded tumor or, or cyan tumors? Here it's not going to help to check one inhibitors for the simple reason that these tumors don't have them. And so in this case, you have to do something better. You have to overcome the exclusion, uh, increase creme attraction, you have to raise immunostimulatory fracture that makes it more immunogenic. It, this can also be done by disrupting cancer cell biology. We'll give examples. Finally, about stemness, this helps in you know, all cases because it's nothing to do with the biology of tumor. In stemness, you want to make T cells that last longer. They can get to the tumor, can colonize and get exhausted. And so that can be done by addressing specific modulators, master regulators of T cell differentiation that uh, can be like CGEN, can be modulated. So for example, how do you approach the, uh, the uh, multiple suppression. A good example is these are real data from our group, is that one way to do it is that you take T cells, CAR T cells, and then you activate them. 
when the T cells get activated by being exposed to the uh, tumor with the target antigen, they make a lot of TIM3 and PD1. They're all positive, get very activated. And so these inhibitory molecules are also activation markers. So they respond to activation by eventually suppressing the functional T cells. Now, if you add a guide RNA, is something that blocks the function particular of one gene, according to the uh, CRISPR interference discussion before, then you only PD1 is unregulated, but thing 3 stays up. Now, if you add what do we call a guide RNA that guides the Cas9 to the thing 3 gene, then only thing 3 is unregulated, but PD or PD1 is up. But if you have both of them, you suddenly you can see you don't regulate both. So this is a way in which you can overcome all the mechanism immunosuppression at once. How does it work? We're showing uh, a uh, something that we work only one at a time is a proof of principle, but now we're expanding to more. And that's a manuscript that is actually under review, but, uh, and, uh, but it's already published online, so you can access that. And this micro shows that, for example, if you have a CAR T cells that recognize HER2, and at the same time, suppress the expression of checkpoint inhibitor like PD1, first thing you will notice uh, is that PD1 is lower. So these are conventional cars. These are the uh, RB341 is the uh, HER2 uh, car T that uh, suppresses PD1 because the guide RNA for PD1. And here is just the same, but without the guide RNA. So it's the same machinery there, but without the specificity. It doesn't do anything in the Cas9 because it's localized anywhere. As you can see, PD1 is much lower at different effect to target ratios. And that results in a much more interleukin-2 production. So homeostatic cytokine, the cells proliferate more and they expand the form much more. Uh, and that's very reproducible. Well, uh, we have seen it very, very producible all the time. And that's a true mechanism of action of PD1. This corresponds also to, pro to a better tumor control. This is the uh, the PD-1 controlled refuge uh, CAR-Ts compared with uh, all the other controls, which include uh, conventional CARs and also the control uh, CARs, uh, refuge CARs without the guide RNA. Most importantly, also includes a combination of the CARs plus the uh, checkpoint blockade. So in this case, also antibody against PD-1, PD-1 were given to the mice to uh, decrease their uh, their ability for PD1 to block, and yet, in spite of very high dose of PD1, you don't need to reach the same results that you reach by using this intrinsic blockade of PD1. And here you can see the tumor volume is in, in individual mice at day 28. As time passes, mice uh, tumor grows, and so as you can see, compared with the other groups in uh, yellow, yellowish here is the refuge cars. You see, they always do better, with some exception of few of the uh, TISO group mice. So the control plus the PD1 blockade this seems to do similarly. But keep in mind that again, this is the survival. But keep in mind that the dose of a TISO that's used here, the PD1 blocking antibody, is very high, it's twice a week. While in humans, the only tolerated dose is once every three weeks. But mice tolerate it because they don't have PD1, human PD1, so they don't have the toxicity of this antibody. Now, how can we use this? Uh, how does it really work? The reality is that these T cells survive longer. So they increase persistence. So these are necropsy data. We're taking the tumor at the end of the experiment and looking how many CAR T cells are there. The true mechanism, we have many, many, many more CAR T cells compared with the other control experiment, conventional CARs or refuge CARs without the gather RNA. And it also corresponds, of course, to a continuous suppression of PD1. Now, among the cells that are there, there are more, there are also a much less PD1. And for the, the technocrats here, it's a very important point, since the system, in, we don't have to go into this detail, but the system includes the use of two um, lentiviral vectors. One of the concerns is whether we have a vector copy number integrated in the cells that is too high. The FDA threshold is five. We're not going to go into the details, but you can see even if you combine these the blue, blue uh, markers, that the blue bars will reflect the amount of vectors or copy numbers based on the total amount of uh, lentiviral integration. This is always, always below the uh, five threshold. In fact, it's always below three. So it's a safe approach. Now, 
So how can we now uh, work instead and see how can we, so we described so far, how you overcome conventional immune resistance, but that's the minority of tumors. And it's not really, and this is true wherever everything seems to be working when you get to immunotherapy. The question is, how do you address the tumors that are resistant to immunotherapy, where in fact, the PD-1 doesn't work, but other immune regulatory uh, mechanisms don't work. And so here is where we are really interested because a large majority of tumors is in these categories. And we, for this, we use CRISPR activation, not suppression. And, it, and an example of this is interleukin-12. This is a poster we just published, and we're preparing a manuscript about that. How does that work? Well, interleukin-12 is actually an heterodimer, two pronates that need to be together combine and then become the inactive IL interleukin-12, which is probably one of the most potent anti-cancer agents known. But the problem is also one of the most toxic known. That's why nobody uses L2L to treat people by systemic delivery because they'll kill them, the patients first. Like COVID would be a very massive uh, cytokine storm. And so here is simply how this is done. So you have a multiplex, and we, again, we don't make those genes. We don't put new genes there. We use just the normal regulatory mechanism of the, of the endogenous genes and only modulate their expression during a, a situation of activation. Otherwise, everything stays in R. And it's very important when you deal with L12 or, or a master regulation of stemness, later we'll show, because in that case, you really don't want to have expression that is not super regulated because these are very toxic. It's not like P1, P1 is not there. Okay, it's going to be a little bit more active than T cell. Here, you're going to have a major production of a very toxic uh, uh, product. And so what we do is very simple. You have, we have a screening tool where we target with the TSS, the transcription stuff side of a gene with different guides uh, for one protein and from the other one. And then eventually we look at the expression of the two. And when we recognize that, in fact, what is the best combination, we apply that to primary T cells. And when you do to this, uh, selecting the probes, you can see a very important thing that here, if you have uh, non-transduced cells, so normal T cells, nothing happens. They don't make an interleukin 12, which is critical. You don't want 12 to, to be made unless necessary. If you use the refuge ones that target the production of the 2 L12, uh, proteins to make P70 deactive L12, also you see the 12 because they're resting. They're not being exposed to any antigen. And here is the control. Here is the same as this, but there is no guidance to for L12. So the machinery is there, but it's not targeting. Now, if you expose the T cells to a cell line like FADU that expresses HER2, so they activates the T cells, then you see L12 only in the product that has the guider in it, the specificity. Zero here, that's critical. You don't want any leakage of L12 unless the T cell recognizes the antigen. An important point is also that what L12 does, it activates the T cell. So if you look at interferon gamma secretion, it's much higher in, this, in an under activation in the L12 producing cells than in the other ones. And that's very important because that's a real mechanism of L12, is a pro inflammatory autocrine mechanism. Uh, many, many, among many other mechanisms we have time to go over. And the doses, however, are very poor. It would be referred to nanoscale delivery is very low. The L2L produces only between 10 and 20. Nothing compared to almost thousands of uh, micrograms um, per ml expressed by our model system, which is a cancer cell line with the L2L being introduced just as a, uh, just as a, a control. That of course, cannot be done in patient. You cannot take out the tumor and put out to out there and put it back. But this is a good way to gauge the functionality. Here you have you have to use at least almost 100 times more uh, IL-12 to achieve the same result and increase in interferon gamma, showing that these are very low dose, but deliver at the right side, right on the T cells. You, you can uh, have a functionality that is very, very much augmented in production on IL-12 or interferon gamma and other factors. So here, if you look, if you take a, a or the if I do cell line, you see that the T cells not only make more interferon gamma, but they kill more. These are the amount of cancer cells against non-transduced cells, control cells, and refuge L12 cells. And they also proliferate more. Very well-known phenomenon L12 
it stimulates pro independent of interleukin 2, it stimulates proliferation of T cells and NK cells. And that's very reproducible. These are an oropharyngeal cancer cell line. And here is a triple negative breast cancer cell line. And you see just the same, you have different factor target ratios. Again, triple negative is a semantics, doesn't mean that it's not R2, although theoretically triple negative means R2 is not there together with the, uh, the different uh, uh, hormone receptors, but in fact, this only means that it's not at a very high level. It's not the level called three plus. Anything below that is actually negative uh, formally, but in fact, it's good enough for the T cells to go and recognize and kill. The life point, point then is about what about fitness? We talked about CGEN. The problem with CGEN is an oncogene. You just can't put that gene as a transgene and uh, expect to uh, be safe in patients for the simple reason that this is the first hit toward, the, toward your cancer transformation is an oncogene. But here, the, our system is different because you target endogenous gene. You don't change that. In fact, the gene, normal genes, endogenous are a very complicated regulatory mechanism of expression, uh, which you can now reproduce in, in synthetically introduced genes simply because it's too long, long the, the part, the, the regulatory part to be uh, introduced with the gene. So you put a very simple promoter of expression, we were called constituted promoters. Here now, you don't do any of that. So the, the old gene remains the same except when the T cells are stimulated. And here's an example where we target genes that are well known to be important to maintain stemness. CJAN, TBET, in R21, are very much similar to GP100, as expected. And here is the summary of all of it. If you do it many donors at different times, you see a flu is always positive, even if you do one or two stimulation, a repeated stimulation. GP1 is always negative, it's just the same for the Cas9 epitopes, making us very comfortable that get at least that is not existing memory. That doesn't mean eventually that you can develop memory, but that's another thing. So I want to conclude thanking everybody for listening. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be available for questions because I'm going to be uh, traveling back from Boston on Saturday, but if I can't make it, to, I'll be available for questions. Otherwise, thank you very much. You can always reach out to me if you have any questions. Thanks again. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> Marincola. This now concludes our first annual Cure Science webinar. Thank you for all of you who attended.